All right, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's live Q&A, specifically designed for law firms. We've talked to about 300 law firms in the last six weeks, and we're happy to share some of the insight and information that we're hearing in that demographic with you today. Let's go to the next slide, just in case you don't know who we are here at Armenino. Our goal, our purpose is to be the most innovative and entrepreneurial firm that makes a positive impact on our clients, our people, and our communities. We're 1,500 people strong um, throughout the West Coast, have lots of accolades. What we're most proud about is the fact that uh, Best of Accounting Client Satisfaction Survey, five years in a row, our clients refer us to more and more clients um, just like you, and that enables us to continuously grow. Our next slide here is our experts. We have Dave Roberts, the head of our law firm services practice. He's been working with law firms for so long. I'm not going to give that up, how long he's been working with law firms, but the insight today will definitely reflect that. We also have uh, Terry and Derek, both directors in our law firm practice, and they're here to share some great insight as well. And lastly, um, in this current crisis that we're in, this pandemic, we're seeing organizations of all kind, but especially law firms, focus in really on four key areas. And they always have to deal with cash and cash controls, government aid and access, HR and managing remote workforces, and lastly, internal and external communications. We'll be sharing some of that insight with you right now. Go ahead, Dave. Thank you, Dean, and, and thanks for not giving away the number of years. I think the last time you said it, it was getting close to, you know, a triple digit, which I really didn't appreciate, Dean. Um, and thank you to all the uh, participants for uh, joining in, all my other professional shut-ins uh, from uh, your remote work facility. So we have everybody else on mute. Uh, so we don't hear any kids screaming or dogs barking. But uh, one of the first things that firms, and kind of jumping right into this, one of the first things firms are focusing on and have been focusing on now for weeks is the cash controls and uh, other management issues. Um, uh, the, the cash, conserving it and uh, projecting it for the future. The expense management, um, evaluating all the compensation uh, from professional staff to admin staff. Most firms we have talked to have already done that. Um, I'm sure many of you out there have seen uh, uh, above the law and the AMLAW stats on who's doing what out there. We'll get into a little more of the details of the salary and the compensation reductions from partners and non-equity uh, uh, partners and associates and staff, um, I believe a little later on. Um, so it's controlling the expenses, reducing obviously all your non-essential expenses, and that's what every business across the country is doing. Unfortunately, um, in our clients' eyes, law firms are usually a non-essential non expense. So that gets right into the next bullet, which is the collection of accounts receivable. Um, that has for many, many firms out there, I don't have to, this is not new news. Um, uh, March may have been a good collection month. We've talked to a lot of law firms, as, as Dean said, 300 plus in just in California in the past uh, six weeks. And uh, more recently, the AR is starting to slow down or the collections are starting to slow down. Uh, what we are suggesting instituting to track a remote workforce is to institute daily time en entry for all timekeepers and to track it, have somebody, your controller, bookkeeper, uh, managing partner, um, track that daily time. That is a, a leading indicator of the capacity and who's working. <clears throat> um, uh, as far as the collections, uh, 
Uh, we see some firms offering clients discounts for immediate or very quick uh, payment. And those discounts range from anywhere from on the low end, 3%. On the high end, we're seeing uh, 10% uh, discounts for a, a quick pay. Um, and then what firms are doing kind of on the management end is reassess, rebudget, reforecast, and then do it uh, over again. Um, it's kind of like uh, washing your hair, uh, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse. Um, so it's re reassessing, rebudgeting, reforecasting over again, over again, and over again. Um, develop really current management reports that let you focus on what are the most critical issues facing your firm today. Firms with multiple practices, it's not just looking at the overall hours. It's looking at this by office, by practice area, by group, however you have to kind of slice and dice this. Um, management reports get into the monitoring of cash that has to be done on at least a weekly basis, if not on a daily basis. Um, and uh, what firms are doing, as I said, is running multiple iterations of the budget and, and, and forecast and, and reassessing truly on a weekly basis um, right now because things are so dynamic out there. Um, next slide. Now into the government aid and access programs. And we got a lot of your questions, kind of pre-questions before this webinar. And, and many of them were focused on this government aid, um, primarily what's referred to as the PPP, um, uh, SBA loan, which is the payroll protection program. Um, that's the first one up there. The second one, the emergency entry disaster loan, what we call the idle loan is a traditional SBA loan uh, maxed out at $2 million. Um, the PPP loan today is out of money, same with the idle loan. Um, and I'll just answer a question that's popped up uh, uh, numerous times. Um, we're expecting uh, Congress to pass another round of funding for the PPP loans, either by tomorrow or Wednesday, we are, we are told. Um, the Main Street uh, program is new out there. It is for what are referred to as larger businesses. Um, minimum loan is a million dollars um, on up. And then there's the payroll tax expense deferral, which we'll talk about a little later, um, which truly, whether you have the PPP loan or not, everyone should be um, applying for that and then the employee retention credit um, loan out there. Those are the various programs. We'll get into a little more of the detail as we go on here. Next slide. So we wanted to um, educate you a little bit about some of the HR and remote workforce issues. This is Terry. And um, there were two leaves which got a lot of press and then fell away due to the PPP rush and excitement. And these two are employee driven, meaning as employers, you can't make your employees take them. One was the emergency sick paid time leave, which is two weeks of leave. And the other one was the expanded family leave. And you know, there's six pieces of criteria. And if employees say, hey, my kids, at, you know, can't, I can't work because my kids' school's closed, et cetera, there's a, um, you know, a certain number of days you can take um, within maybe the extended leave. Um, if you're caring for a, a sick person or if you're sick, it just depends. So there's a lot of things that happen within there. I think employers thought that it was gonna be easy money in, in your pocket, but um, it wasn't. And I think the only other thing I wanna say about that is that you can't be getting credits for uh, or getting paid back for these leaves for giving employees money for these leaves um, or it really can't be done uh, with the PPP money. And we'll get into that too. But one of the things that I think Derek's gonna talk about next is getting your time entry and attendance pro processes tightened up. And this is a, a place where that would be really important to do that as you're trying to figure out the PPP loan. 
So Derek. Yeah, this is Derek, and I'll comment that on it. Uh, you know, really from the financial side, as they've mentioned, um, most firms have switched to um, a daily time entry, and it's super important not just to make sure that your people are doing what they need to be doing um, when they need to be doing it and staying busy and efficient, um, but it's also it also gives you an ability to track your clients and, and how much work you're putting in uh, for certain clients. When you're looking at your AR and your collections, um, you need this time in because if a client gets too far down the road and you can't collect that money, that is a major investment that could really significantly hurt the firm if you're not tracking it. This, this is Terry. Let me just jump in with one other thing about the timesheets. Um, a lot of our timesheets are not um, meant to really tell when an employee puts a timesheet in for you to pay through payroll, they don't generally give us a lot of information. There's not a lot of choices. And because of all these different loans and um, maybe people are on furloughs or maybe um, some are on a leave of absence or a sick leave or who knows what working part-time and you're paying them full-time, you really need to be thinking about getting your timesheet up to date with, so that you can capture all these different kinds of things that are happening. It'll make it way easier when you go to run payroll and or try to get some of this money back or forgiven or whatever it is. You really have to have your timesheets in a very tight place. Yeah, and that, that goes then into the uh, managing the PPP loan funds to maximize forgiveness. Um, when you're talking about forgiveness, you're really talking about a few different buckets. Um, one is the allowable expenses, um, which is going to be payroll, rent, utilities, mortgage interest. Um, and then that's your, your baseline, but then you also may have some reductions for your employee headcount, as well as um, certain reductions in salary that you've uh, given to certain employees. So you know, there's for each firm, and we've done this analysis a few times, there's there's really a, a maximum um, or a, a, an optimal calculation of all this, where you're really managing how you're doing your layoffs, furloughs, or, um, or salary reduction so that it results in the ultimate um, maximum loan forgiven. And what that does is it, it does what uh, the bill is intended to do. It, it really allows you to to uh, retain jobs. Um, so when you're maximizing this, it, it is really kind of everybody together looking to, to make the best out of a tough situation and maximize the amount of loans that are forgiven for the firm. Derek, looking towards the future? Yeah, so when you're looking at, um, at the, the new normal for risk of sounding cliche, um, you really need to kind of think past the crisis, past the 13 weeks, past, you know, when we get through this, what is the new normal going to look like? And how do we rebudget things? How do we rebudget um, our, our client work? What clients are still going to be around? Um, when we've been navigating through these tough times, what are our core competencies and how are we repackaging those to our clients and what revenue will that bring? Is there any investment needed? Um, one big thing is going to be space and what's, what space you need to really run the business in the, the real optimal way. So we got let, a lot. Let me, Terry, let, ahead, this is yeah. Dave, let me go ahead and butt in on this, kind of looking towards the future after, you know, um, the, the, the PPP funds um, are in and you're using them or we're at the end of the PPP funds. Um, the concerns that we see and that we've talked with a number of law firms about kind of the major concerns right now is obviously, like I said, the cash, the cash management and the cash collections uh, is number one. A second a big concern is what's going to be the duration of this. And obviously nobody, nobody knows. Um, and then kind of right on the heels of that, it's what's going to happen to our client base? And it, are we going to experience a revenue loss? Um, because our clients are, are filing bankruptcy or downsizing. I was just on a, uh, a call this morning with a um, uh, much larger firm and they were saying their, their 
predicting about a 60% revenue loss in the short term. That is huge. Most of the firms we've talked to are not predicting anything close to that, but um, that's pretty significant. So many clients are looking at a revenue loss slash client loss out there. Then obviously this whole working remotely, um, what's going to happen on the rebound? How many, how many people are going to be able to work remotely? Um, what's that going to do to our tech structure, our security structure, our real estate footprint, um, and our in, entire model of how we move uh, forward? And then just kind of a, a, a high level concern is the overall long-term profit of future profitability of, of firms. Is it going to bounce back to normal? And I don't know that anybody predicts that. So as Dara kind of said, and as everybody's, you know, kind of coining the, the phrase, the new normal and what, what that's going to look like. And let's not forget, I mean, just because we had this or are or, or in this um, uh, global crisis, the issues that plagued uh, many firms prior to the crisis still are, still are there. Um, uh, succession planning, huge. Uh, that has not gone away. Um, uh, poor performing practice areas, uh, uh, poor performing uh, partners or, 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 or associates, um, the entire M&A area, uh, which has, has really been shut tight right now um, what's going to happen in, in, in that when, when people start going back to work and, and all these issues kind of come back up again. Um, so those are just some of the issues that we're looking, uh, uh, towards into the, into the future. Hey Dave, and I, I, I got a comment from a, a partner at a law firm, um, about the, the working from home concept. And, um, they said before all this, I really looked down upon it. I didn't want people working from home because I didn't feel that they could be as efficient as they need to be and we couldn't monitor them. And what these last few weeks has really done is, is proven me wrong. Um, and I feel that sentiment when I talk to others. Um, many are really happy with how it's going and the productivity that they're experiencing, even despite not being able to, to go into the office and, and grab the paper files that they're used to grabbing um, and using them to do their work. Um, so I. I I can already feel there's been a big change that seems to be sticking. Yeah, yeah, agreed. Okay, next so, slide, I, I think, or, or Terry, you wanted well, to I have, Let me go back just for a second, uh, Dean. Uh, Dean. Um, we got a lot of questions about um, what it's gonna look like when we go back. And I guess what I wanted to say on top of those things is most of the questions are about physical. Are we gonna, you know, go in tiers, are we gonna rotate? How's it gonna be six feet apart and all that kind of stuff. And those are really important questions and we could do, and maybe we will a whole nother, you know, uh, webinar on that. But I think we need to be thinking not just about the physical um, aspects of it, but also about the mental aspects of it. Our lives have changed as Dave and Derek have both said. And while, you know, we're trying to say, how are we gonna get back to that normal? We also have to be thinking about what other people that we've been now paying and keeping on ice and, you know, hoping that we get back to work. What does that look like for them as well? And how are people going to work in their best manner? There's a lot of stuff out there on the physical sides and what you need to buy and all that kind of stuff. But let's be thinking about the um, sort of the mental side of it, too. Thanks, Dean. Go to next, next, next slide. Okay, so internal communications. I just want to talk about um, some a couple of things. Um, I feel like um, what we have seen is people want to talk to each other, and they don't just want to talk; they want to see each other and talk. And where before I think we were, oh, I'll just shoot them an email or a text message. Wouldn't even pick up the phone. I think now we're more apt to pick up the phone and actually have a connection with somebody other than just going back and forth in an email. And I think that that's maybe a good thing um, that's coming out if, you know, I am an HR person, but um, before 
you know, we were happy not to call. And now we really want to see people and communicate. I would say we need to communicate the good stuff. Um, so when the hard stuff comes, we need to keep our employees engaged with frequent communications on little things, stand up meetings in the morning, maybe taking off early and have a, having a game or drinks or something like that. Letting others within the firm step up and lead some of these meetings having open communication um, at the beginning of the day, the end of the day, and be honest and frank. Communicate your tough decisions and impacts to the business along with, um, along with some of the um, you know, negative aspects. Uh, you need to do some positive aspects too. And you know, I guess I would say be honest. Yeah, that's right, Terry. I think you really want to focus in on, you know, this is a great time. Uh, people are very captive listeners right now, whether it's internal or external, right? We're all working from home and we're all adjusting. And, you know, we all welcome that conversation. I think that when you think about your external, your clients and, um, and your network there, definitely lean in and, and communicate with them just as much as you do internally, right? I think people love it when uh, another human is human and they show that they care, right? They're not just talking about services, but they're talking about how they can help. Um, I know here at Armenino, uh, we've stood up our, our COVID-19 resource center. That has done great for us. I, I recently talked to uh, a potential prospect this morning and she said, Dean, I just saw all that you guys have been doing on LinkedIn and it, and it really talked to me. It spoke to me and I really wanted to explore what that partnership could look like. So, you know, for your law firms, that's something that you might want to be uh, considering as well. Hey, Dean, let me just add one comment to that internal com communication, because I think within Armenina, we've done an awesome job and people have felt a lot closer um, and I've heard from a number of law firms that they've done very similar things with Zooms and you know, really consistent uh, meetings with their staff. One thing that uh, I've learned uh, a little bit the hard way um, is that you just like in person, you're going to have too many meetings. Um, and working from home, um, the lines get a little blurry, the work time. So all of a sudden people are calling or setting Zoom meetings for eight o'clock at night or, or, or calling or, or doing that. So, you know, trying to have some uh, parameters uh, for your staff is, is really important. And realizing that people are sitting in front of a screen, um, there's a lot of strain on that. So even with these happy hours, um, they can, uh, I know, uh, there was a, a group, uh, um, uh, Friday that had a happy hour scheduled and I said, I cannot sit in front of a screen for another, for another half hour and, and play and talk and, and stuff. So just being respectful of, of people's, um, strain with, with all of this is, is important. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think that's right. Right now is the time to be more human and understand people um, like we never have before. And I think that that's where you could really add the most value in our relationships. Okay. With that said, Terry, is there anything else we wanted to cover on this slide or we, can we start getting to the meat of all of these questions that we're seeing to come, uh, come across? I say, let's get to the questions. Oh boy, here we go. Okay, let's see. So we wanted to start off with, with some of our FAQs first um, because we did ask people to, to give us some of their questions. Let's, let's see the first couple, if, if we don't mind here. Yeah, I mean, there are organizations that are getting PPP uh, funds. Dave, what are they doing? What's the most strategic ways that you see people using those dollars? Uh, the PPP funds. Um, it's actually an interesting and important question. Most firms focus on uh, trying to hit as much forgiveness as possible, 100% forgiveness. Um, and that's really strategic, but there's really two strategies. Um, this is the PPP loan is number one, a loan. And the second part is forgiveness. But the loan, um, the concept, the, the strategy of it, is if you shouldn't be keeping people on and you're better off, and that's a strategic focus, 
to really downsize your staff for the long term. Um, I would rather have a loan at 1%, albeit payable over two years, than not have it. Um, so the forgiveness is important, but you may also think of, hey, we, we, if we don't forgive it, it's really just a loan um, uh, at, at, a, at a very, very nice interest rate. So the primary purpose is a forgiveness, and the forgiveness, as many people know, is based on your payroll or your, what, what they call your personnel cost, which is your salary up to $100,000. Um, your benefits and profit sharing uh, amounts, and that has to cover 75%. The other 25% can be covered by your rent um, and your utilities. If you happen to own a building, it can be your, your mortgage interest and your, your utilities. Um, that cap, that during the forgiveness period, what many people don't, um, aren't aware of, is the calculation on the loan amount was $100,000 per person. That was a maximum compensation you can take, take into account. And people calculate that as $8,333 a month. During this eight-week forgiveness period, it is not $8,333 a month. It is basically calculated on a weekly basis, which happens to come out to $7,692 per month, if you calculate that on a weekly basis at $100,000. So when you're looking at the loan forgiveness, and a lot of people have asked questions about how do we calculate it, and is there a checklist, and all those great things, um, that's one of the, the nuances of how you calculate it. But the strategy is trying to use it for the intended purposes salary, benefits, profit sharing, rent and utilities. That actually takes us to our next question is, well, okay, we get to June 30, you know, the PPP money we got is gone, now what? Yeah, and uh, that's, uh, <laughs> that's gonna be the next important uh, issue that comes up, I mean, everybody, I think everybody on this call, everybody that we've talked to have been so heads down, uh, focused on getting this PPP, getting into their banks, wrestling their banks, redoing the applications and waiting for an answer. So we've been so focused on this PPP program. Um, now the question is, okay, now it's starting to fund. There's supposed to be new money out there for people who didn't get it. But the question is, what happens um, at June 30th when we're done with the, the, the PPP? And it's hopefully the shelter in place orders have been lifted or at least lifted somewhat so we can get back to business and courts are open. Um, and the question is now, you know, now what do we do? And that's really where the deep strategy comes in. Uh, I do not have the, the, um, the crystal ball to say, here's what's going to happen. Uh, we're still in the fog and the quicksand, but we have to be ready. And that's where I said earlier, to look into your individual practice areas, to see which ones are really going to rebound and how they're going to rebound, how you're going to, um, your structure, your organizational structure from uh, uh, having a remote or partially remote workforce is going to, to, to be, um, uh, and really getting deeply into the, to the planning phase. Um, as I, I also said earlier, all the issues that were uh, on the table before COVID-19 are still there. It is only going to be heightened um, uh, of how we deal with these and what's going to happen. So the answer is a little, you know, uh, conceptual and vague because it's going to be different for uh, many of the different practice areas uh, out there. Uh, Dave, some yeah, go one ahead. of the things I think we can um, kind of give some clarity to, one of the people is asking um, with regards to the calculation and the $100,000 limitation, um, 
what, what was in there again is they wanted to know the, the monthly calculation for that. Can oh you, you yeah. Just... It's $7,692. Great. Thank you. That's, that's the monthly cap. That's the maximum times okay. 50. Yeah. Times the number of weeks that should, should equal a hundred thousand dollars if my math is correct. Um, the next question is kind of what you were alluding to, and it was the leading indicators coming forward. What, you know, when you talk about health of the firm going forward and, and what that looks like, maybe we can give some insight into that. Yeah, this is Derek. I'll, I'll take that one. Um, it's changed a little bit. As, as Dave said, um, all the, the old problems have not gone away. So, you know, your rates, your realization, um, all really important things um, of increasing importance um, is client intake, matter intake. What, what are you going to be investing in? Um, because when you're managing your WIP and your receivables, um, you're, you're really managing your investment. Um, and that's one of the, the big indicators that, that we've been looking at lately is uh, how many days are you, do you have outstanding in, in WIP and AR? Um, and keeping that number as low as possible uh, is, is super important and you have to do it on the front end. So you have to be looking at your practice areas. Are there historical problems? Are there areas that need to, to be watched or in industries that we know there's really significant risk or opportunity? And then clients, same thing. Even a, uh, a bad client in a good industry can still put the firm in a really tough place. Um, so the metrics we're looking at more are, are really trying to indicate, is that payment coming in the door and when? Um, we can't be investing in um, a client that's going to pay in six to nine months if we're uncertain about the next 13 weeks. Well, that brings up our very next question. What are organizations doing to improve collection right now? Yeah, there's there's a couple of issues. Uh, I'm sure everybody uh, on the call has experienced one of them. Either their clients are not paying really quickly because they can't get into the office to to cut checks, or the client has paid but nobody's in your office and you've got a check just sitting in the mail. Um, makes it really difficult to manage this collection process. So on top of people just staying on it, um, calling clients not just whenever it, it, it comes around in the cycle, but really managing it and calling you know, monthly for sure uh, every couple of weeks if things are, if clients are slow to pay and things slow down a little bit. Um, also firms are investing in different types of tools. If you look at um, uh, LawPay or Bill.com, those are two softwares that are available um, for clients to use to accept payment and you can see it right away. Clients can pay via credit card and you can manage your remote capabilities a lot better uh, and ultimately um, better manage your collections process and speed them up. Great, great. With regards to um, uh, the next question here is, you know, with regards to PPP loan forgiveness, um, what kind of support are we looking for here, Terry? Well, from the um, HR and payroll, um, part of it is uh, getting the numbers correct with the headcount. And there's a specific, it's pretty clear, but there's a specific thing that um, you do to count it if you're trying to maximize your forgiveness. Um, thinking about rehiring those who were laid off or on a furlough to either be able to pay them now and use that money against the forgiveness or the headcount and reinstating any pay. If you um, put an individual's compensation, if it was decreased by more than 25%, then it needs to be reinstated to above 25%. Um, it's not, it's on an individual basis, not on a um, annual basis or through everybody. And then finally, I think um, working with your payroll companies, you know, if you've done your timesheets properly, you should be able to, I, I know there was a, somebody saying, well, we don't pay weekly, we, or we pay twice a month or what have you. But in the calculation of this, um, to see what the forgiveness amount might be, you need to be converting your payroll into a weekly payroll, not that you're paying it that way, but using your payroll reports to um, get weekly information so that you can track it in a weekly way versus um, on a pay by pay, you know, 15th of the 30th. Hey, Terry? Yes. 
Um, question. If you have a employee who's uh, was working full time 40 hours and let's say, you know, many firms reduced, uh, especially admin staff, 20%, you know, one day. So they're working, you know, let's say 32 hours, but you're paying them um, uh, the same or their hourly wage, you know, their hourly rate is the same. Are they in, included as a full time, as a one, or are they now included as a, as a 0.8 full time equivalent? I, I believe it's one. It's a, it's a, I don't think it's an F, FTE, it's a head count. count. Okay. And I know that um, not part of the, the panelists, but, you know, one of our um, managers in our group who did a lot of research in this, uh, Omar is on the, on the call. And Omar, if you have any input on, on that specific question, please feel free to to chime in. Hey, uh, yeah, this is Omar. Uh, from what I read, I believe it's going to be based on a ratio of your normal work hours. So if you normally work 40 and you're reduced to 32, I believe it is a reduction in the full-time equivalent. Unfortunately, we just haven't received the guidance to, to be sure on that, though. In general, though, that, that type of transaction would be accompanied by a reduction of pay. Um, to go along with it. So if you're reducing somebody's hours, um, you're, you're likely not going to keep their pay the same. Um, so I, 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 while the calculation, um, while the calculation may say that the paycheck is adequately protected. Uh, so it, I, we have to get into the details there. There's a lot of guidance coming out on this. Um, okay. And it changes every day. Yeah. Okay. I, and I know many people, so consider them, those persons working 32 hours as an FTE. So uh, more to come on that. Great. You know, Dave, uh, I'm not going to give away your years of expertise, but one of the questions is that we've got a lot is, is with regards to the crystal ball. And, you know, there's been downturns in the past. So this one seems to be a little unique. What, what are we seeing? Yeah, um, I wish my, you know, 30 plus years of, of experience in the legal community gave me a, a shiny crystal ball that could tell the future in this. This is really within mine and everybody's uh, professional career. There's been nothing like this. It's hard to tell because this is going to be um, uh, a recession. Um, it's probably going to be a global recession and the rebound time, which in the beginning people were talking about was going to be pretty quick. Now everybody uh, feels is going to be a long protracted uh, period of time before we get back up to whatever the new normal is, um, which is going to tax a lot of our uh, uh, structures um, and is going to create new opportunities um, out there. So um, unfortunately, it's going to create a lot more consternation, at least for 2020. So um, the people that I'm talking to, they are not looking for a rebound in Q2. And when we start talking about Q3 and Q4, that's to protect the protracted period. And when we talk about a return, um, you know, is this a, a return in the, in, the, in the shape of a V where you just hit bottom and, and bounce right, right back up? Is it kind of in the shape of a U where you kind of hang out towards the bottom and make a slow, gradual climb? Or is it the unfortunate L shape where you just go down and stay down for a long period of time? And right now, that's what people are talking about and nobody really knows. So when we talk about what's going to happen after June 30th and what now, this is really a serious time that nobody, no managing partner, no COO, no CFO, nobody uh, has, has experienced before. Uh, and we have to look at the individual practice areas and really think outside our, our, our experience, our box, 
to what might the future bring and how we take advantage of the potential opportunities out there. Great, great. Another question we've been seeing is, you know, because of the uncertainty, we definitely see a lot of underutilized staff. Terry, what, what are our suggestions there? Well, I know a lot of really smart and creative administrators and HR people, and I think we're all sort of, you know, grappling with it. Um, there may be some things, you know, if everyone's working remotely, it makes it very difficult to do that. But maybe there's things that you can do online, like, um, you know, uh, rename things in the system, file stuff electronically into, you know, the client files better. Some of the things that we said, oh, I'll do that when I have time would be what would get started. But maybe you can have some of that help um, going toward, especially if you're paying people, um, going toward your business development, um, looking up contacts, helping you, you know, do a webinar or those kinds of things. In fact, if the attorneys aren't busy, busy that's, you know, when it said get creative, then maybe the attorneys could be doing more of that business development that is not taking people to lunch, but, you know, in a different way. And I think that the staff could contribute to that in a big way. Um, we just don't usually use them because for tasks like that because they don't have time. But if you have people with time, I think maybe figuring out what you're going to be doing in quarter two and three and four and with the clients would be a good use of staff. Yeah, right. and let me jump in real quick on that one too, because an underutilized staff uh, from a diagnostic standpoint is something you've got to uh, think of. And we were talking about this the past couple of days, um, even though this is Monday. Um, people and firms are starting to talk about uh, AI, artificial intelligence, and most predominantly the lowest level, the robotic process automation, the RPAs, to see where it might be able to take over some of these processing functions and um, where we're still right in the middle of the eye of the storm here and nobody's making any investments, people are starting to talk about this. So if you have um, a, a underutilization of staff, it's kind of symptomatic um, to maybe a, a, an issue that has to be resolved in some uh, different way than we've looked at before. Well, Dave, that actually brings up a good question that, that came in here. Um, it says that, um, could you hire new employees doing the quote, during the quote unquote covered period that better support firm strategies in our new normal? The answer is yes, you can. You just need to be careful firing people and hiring new people back. And um, I know that there's a couple of labor law attorneys on this call that you probably want to talk to before you go out and replace everybody that you let go, depending on how long ago it was and what the needs are. But of course you can, they're not saying that you have to hire back the, the same people that you let go. Great, great. Okay, part of our new normal is working at home. Our next question, Derek, should people be t looking at taking the uh, home office deduction? Uh, Absolutely. Um, it's kind of, kind of an interesting way to look at it. Um, you know, when you take the deduction, you have to use your home substantially and regularly for business. Um, where you used to have an office to go to, it was a, a bit of a, an issue to overcome um, in proving that it's your principal place of business. But it, it, you know, depending on how long this goes for, it's absolutely something um, that you should look into taking a deduction for because um, if you can prove that it's substantially and regularly used for your business, there's an opportunity. Uh, you also have to worry about um, the exclusive use factor. So uh, if, if anybody on this call has their kids or, or pets or uh, family kind of walking by them and, and sharing the desk with them, um, or you're set up in your den um, and you clear it out once you're done with the workday and then you're able to have dinner in there, um, you know, that creates an issue of exclusive use. But I think it, most definitely you should be looking at 
um, at this deduction and whether it could apply to the circumstances that you're in now. All right, and, and Dean, let me answer that a little further because somebody else asked a question and this kind of goes to it. If, if people are working remotely and may not be coming back into the office or coming back in five days a week, so there may be a partial lessening upon the, uh, on the rent burden or the space needs. Um, a question right now is, are landlords um, open to rent deferrals? Um, the vast majority of law firms are uh, asking or talking with their landlords about some kind of rent deferral. Be careful. There are two issues going on that you have to balance. One is most firms also applied for the PPP. So if you have a PPP, um, you part of the forgiveness calculation is the rent that you pay. So if you get a deferral, you're paying less rent or no rent. So be careful of that. If you do have a deferral, you probably wanna make it after your PPP forgiveness uh, period, which would push it out to uh, uh, July. Um, and are landlords giving rent deferrals? They are all discussing it, every single one of them. Uh, some are, and some are just doing nothing and are silent on it. Um, many are saying we will not penalize you uh, for paying your rent late, um, which is basically a rent deferral. You know, I'll pay it when I get it and there'll be no penalties. But again, um, right now, because nobody's, uh, you know, or very few people are going into the office and when they do uh, start, probably few people will be going into the office um, or a lot less. Um, just be careful when you start that rent deferral period uh, if you do have a PPP. Thanks, Dean. Well, Dave, actually, there's another question I think that um, would be really good for us to answer right now, and that's that firms really tend to try and use cash for purposes or for purchases um, that under other industries might finance or lease. Any insight on that, and do you see that changing at all? Um, uh, um, such as... Um, uh, IT equipment or, or, or something. Is that what you're referring to, Dean? You know, they, they didn't give the um, particular particulars of what they were talking about, but just, just the overall mindset of not carrying debt on, on firm books and just paying everything in cash. And right now with cash being so important for every single oh, organization, yeah. what, 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 what do we see there? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think firms are really just the opposite. Um, uh, many firms have, in the beginning when this started, asked if they had a line of credit and they didn't, if they had pulled up on it partially or maybe not at all. Many firms went ahead and just took out the, you know, the full line of credit and put the cash in the bank, again, to conserve cash, not to worry about, you know, having a loan on the books. Uh, many firms looked at increasing their, their line of credit. Um, uh, you know, City uh, Citibank handles a lot of the very large firms, and they really had at the very beginning of this almost a run on the bank. People with lines of credits of fifty million and a hundred million dollars um, that just came in and pulled out all the money and put it in a bank account. So um, that puts a lot of stress straight on on the bank. But that's what firms are 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 doing, I guess, I guess the majority of firms are doing, not everybody, um, are taking out the loans, trying to conserve the cash, lasting as long as possible because we don't know the exact end of this. The end of this is not June 30th, that is for sure. So conserving cash is the absolute most important thing that uh, any business, uh, especially a law firm, uh, can, can do right now. So I would suggest or recommend uh, the opposite of not paying things in cash is, is financing where possible or holding off payment. Great, great. One of the things, um, Derek, that a lot of people wrote in questions on was with regards to, you know, enabling 
uh, more nimble movement, mo being quicker uh, in the marketplace? And is there anything that they could do with regards to technology or operation to make that happen? Um, yeah, and, and my response to that is flexibility is, is key. Um, you can't be an expert in and it, you know everything, um, and what's what's really key in in this time is is uh, information fast because you need to make quality decisions quickly. Um, so technology, um, you know, fortunately, if this happened ten years ago, uh, the the outlook right now would be totally different because technology, fortunately, has moved so significantly toward the cloud. A lot of firms. Are, are really where they're experiencing some inconvenience and maybe some issues um, are, are really being successful in having people work remotely. Um, operations wise, it's a little tougher. You've, you've furloughed people, um, you, you've, you've let people go. Um, you just don't have the efficiency that you're used to having when you're sitting at the office with people. So we've gotten a lot of calls um, as consultants um, to help fill some voids in, in some of the, uh, the operational tasks. Um, so I, I would say relying on consultants and finding the experts to, to help you get through this is really important. And that's what a lot of firms are doing um, to be nimble and get things done really quickly and effectively um, when they can't be going to the office and, and kind of doing things the way they used to. Great. What do we think about potentially this downturn accelerating retirement um, of the uh, of the greatest generation of the baby boomer generation? Oh, uh, the old guy on the panel will take that one. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I, I, I see that happening. Um, again, right now, everybody is heads down, hanging on. Um, but when we go into Q3 and Q4, um, I think that is going to be really apparent. It is really unsavory as these layoffs have been. There is nothing harder than to do a reduction in force or layoffs. Um, and looking at your partner group and, um, uh, if they're unproductive, and especially the ones that maybe should have retired a few years back, this is going to put a tremendous amount of pressure that I think will be unbearable for firms and will force the issue where it has been a lot more uh, gentle in the past. Um, I, I think the gloves will come off and we'll see this conversation uh, come up um, uh, a, a lot, especially if partners are uh, less than, than productive or underproductive. Got it, got it. What do we think about, you know, outsourcing has been a trend in, in law firms. What do we think about any kind of increase in reliance on outsourcing or um, those types of related functions going forward? Yeah, for, this is Derek. From my perspective, Dean, um, it, it makes sense. Um, you know, you, as I said before, you're, you're really looking um, for quality information quickly so that you can make quality decisions. Um, outsourcing just lends itself to that. It's the, the core competencies um, that we have that help us outsource and get our clients information. Um, and I'll just jump on the, the next question uh, that I see on the board there is looking to start um, my own firm. Um, thank you to whoever asked that one, um, because the, the clear answer is uh, it's call us. Um, we do a lot of work with, uh, with standing up firms, uh, whether it's um, finding the right systems to stand up, or what is even more critical is helping with the business plan. Um, you know, what do I need to invest to start this business? What's my risk? Uh, what are my monthly expenses going to be once I kind of get things stood up and, and underway? Um, so uh, it's really important to know what you're getting yourself into and uh, do a feasibility study of can this work for me and is it worth either taking the jump um, or if if been laid off and 
and are looking for work where you look for work, whether it's on your own or, or seeking it at another firm. Great, we have about five more minutes. So please everyone keep asking your questions. I really like the one at the bottom. How do we see the practice of law changing as a result of the current environment? What do we think? Mm. Uh, Terry, you have any uh, thoughts on that? And then I'll uh, chime in or Derek. Yeah, I, you know, we used to always be doing the statistics on like secretaries to attorneys and all these different ratios. I see the practice of law as getting away from that and learning how to practice law in the right way for the client more than what helps me as the attorney to get something done. So we're all used to now kind of working on our own, figuring it out, printing our stuff or PDFing or whatever it is. And I see that continuing and I see that um, there's a lot of resilient attorneys and staff and there's a lot of people who are willing to change and move. And I see this as another huge opportunity to do that and be looking at the client and saying, what's the right way to deliver services to this client? Awesome, awesome. What about um, in our last couple minutes here, you know, salary reductions are real. How are we communicating those and, and expectations around that? And Dean, let me go back for a second, just, you know, kind of add on to Terry's comments about kind of the changing practice. Um, and I know everybody is is concerned about the PPP and the loan forgiveness and how that is is calculated. And you're all free to 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 you know shoot emails and and you know we'll answer those. But I did want to talk about kind of past PPP, and this gets right to the heart of it: is the practice of law changing, um, really as a result of what's happened. You know, we've experienced, you know, one of our clients said, all I really needed was a good 8.9 earthquake to, to get things <laughs> on track with our, with our group and really shake things up. And this is the 8.9. Um, I don't see things going back to the, 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 the way they were. I think there are a lot of people out there that will start, um, to look for um, new ways to practice and new ways of delivery and new communication tools. And as I said earlier, AI and everything else that we have in a very gentle kind of conversational process talked to before, but because of the succession planning and because of a lot of other issues, um, it was kind of, you know, don't upset the uh, apple cart. And the apple cart has been turned over and, and broken. So there's nothing to upset. We're in the, this tsunami of, 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 of change out there. So now it's looking at how do we put this back together to function as um, efficiently and effectively in the new age as can possibly be. And that's what people are really, really focusing on. And that's, that's exciting. And that's taking care of opportunities. It's, it's, it's really darn scary at the same time, because, you know, most of us have years of experience with dealing with anything from office moves to IT investments and, and integration of new technologies and things like, you know, the, the, the normal stuff that we've all dealt with. This is now not the normal stuff and we're not going back there. It's trying to figure out what the, 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 the new delivery methodology is going to be and the efficiency and the operational structures and the opportunities that we can really take advantage of. And the firms that do that will have, um, you know, first to market advantage. And that's where I start to see some of these younger or younger at at mind at least, firms start starting to brainstorm. And that is going to be really significant. And that goes, you know, just right past the PPP and the forgiveness and all, all those things are important. And how do we get people back to work safely and hoteling and, and, and you know, the humanity of, of what we're doing here and, and, and retiring partners. But I will tell you, the entire delivery methodology in the next 
six to 12 to 18 months has been supercharged. And as soon as people start getting out of this Q2 mess, um, that will be the number one uh, topic at hand. That is very exciting, Dave. Great, great to, way to end our uh, Q&A session today. Please, everyone, go to our COVID-19 Resource Center. Um, but I think the big thing is, is there's going to be huge opportunities moving forward for those who are best poised to take advantage of this opportunity. Our last slide, if you have any questions, please reach out to any of us or Kendra Edson. Um, she's there for you. We're all here for you in this great time. We can do this together. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, guys.